Welcome to Brevis Talk. The talks you are about to hear will be honest, revealing, and unfiltered. Join us as your host, Pastor Wayne Whiteside, lifts the lid of silence and has conversations about mental illness and health in the church. The goal here is simple. It is to help someone along this journey of life who is struggling. It is to tell the truth to the unsuspecting, and it is to lighten the load of a fellow traveler. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not intended to serve as medical advice or to replace consultation with your physician or mental health professional. If you are experiencing a medical crisis, call 911 or go to the nearest emergency room. Now, here's your host, Pastor Wayne. I'd like to welcome you to another Brevis Talk. Thank you for stopping by. We're going to call this episode, The God Chasers, Part 2. I want to begin with scripture, a theme especially. I think you'll find out what it is or figure out what it is. Deuteronomy 4.29 says, But from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find Him if you seek Him with all your heart and with all your soul. First Chronicles chapter 16 verse 11 says, Seek the Lord and His strength. Seek his face evermore. Psalm 63, verse 1, O God, you're my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My soul longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. Psalm 105, verse 4, Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face evermore. Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 5. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. And Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. An episode back, I made mention of A.W. Tozer and the small booklet, The Pursuit of God. Again, I would encourage you to secure a copy of that and to read it and read it not to be reading it, but read it slowly and thoughtfully. I think uh, you'll walk away with a hopefully a greater hunger and a greater thirst for God, but certainly a greater knowledge of God. Well, I want to quote from A.W. Tozer today, and he says this about the Spirit-filled life. He says that if you can live without the fullness of, of the Holy Spirit, you will. Now, I don't have time to develop the truth and the topic of those who are satisfied in their own satisfaction. They're not hungry for God. They're not thirsty for God. They make up leader positions, leadership positions in our churches. They are faithful attenders. They sit in our pews They know all the trappings, the worship songs. They know everything that can be known about church. But they're not hungry people. Some time ago, I was a pastor at a church. My wife and I talked about that one time. We said, you know, these are the best people on the planet. They're just absolutely wonderful people. But they are not a godly people. They are not hungry and thirsty for the righteousness of God. They were good, very good, exceedingly good people, great neighbors, great friends. But they were not hungry for God and for the things of God. And I'll tell you to accept no substitutes for God and for His Word. Let me try to make a point here. We have fillers in this world, and we have fillers in the church. These things fill, but they do not fulfill. 
They feel us, but they do not fulfill us because they are not according to the design of God. Truth in advertising. Take a can of food, can of corn, can of peas or beans off of your shelf, out of your cupboard, and take a look at the ingredients. Uh, They're required, whatever is the number one ingredient, they're required for it to be listed first. Same way with potato chips. You look at the ingredients of potato chips and you're going to see potatoes as number one. Take dog food, for instance. I'm an old dog trainer. And some will begin, those dog, those ingredients on a sack of dog food, some will begin with a meat is making up the most plentiful ingredient, but not all dog foods. Some will have corn is a number one ingredient. And quite often that's being dishonest. Because a lot of these dog foods contain not only corn, but the cobs of corn. They take corn and the cobs and grind them up. They are fillers, cheap dog food. No nutrients there coming out from that cob. That is simply filler. You think you're feeding your dog quite well because you offer the dog, you put two cups, two scoops, three cups or whatever you're using as a scoop, you put it in the bowl and you that dog gets that amount of food. But for those cheaper dog foods, he is simply taking in corn cobs. They're fillers. They have no nutritional value. They simply take up space. You go and read this if you care. But a corn cob is simply insoluble fiber and it's called cellulose. It's a waste, but it is a fulfiller. We have fulfillers in our churches. We have these things that we come and we're filled with them. But are we getting full of the Word of God? Are we being ongoing? Are we being filled with the Holy Spirit? Ephesians 5 Verse 18 says to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't be filled with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Greek New Testament there, that is a the line there defining that it is a continuous action. Be ye being filled and filled and filled and filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to introduce you to two more God chasers. The first is a gentleman by the name of Abel Ochoa. Horrible crime. He murdered five of his family members while he was on crack cocaine. Not excusing him for that, and he never did either. I never knew Abel in that state, but everything he ever told me he said was true. If you've heard that I was a bad person, it's true. If you've read the news accounts, uh, the newspaper articles, every bit of it is true, and then more. I was a very, very bad person. His remorse and self-loathing in his life were perpetual, ongoing, just crying over his sea and crying over the train wreck that he was the engineer of. Well, I heard about his love for and his walk with Jesus Christ. And other inmates told me that he was full of God's word and full of the joy of the Lord. And so I was challenged to go see Ochoa. And I'm telling you that statement absolutely described him. Here was a man full of God and full of the joy of the Lord. Remembering quite well, he was short of stature. He was very, very energetic, and he talked extremely fast. I didn't, honestly, didn't get everything that he said because he just was, he was almost like 
an auctioneer slowed down just a bit. Um, he would ask me and others, what verse are you looking at today? His idea of Bible study was you should take one verse of Scripture and you should focus on that verse all day, all throughout the day. Take one verse. And I agree with that. I, the goal is not to read the Bible through and see how quick you can do it and be able to say at the end of your life, I read from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, and I did that 17 times or whatever number throughout my life. It's uh, it's not about speed reading the Word of God. It's about reading the Word of God and letting the Word of God be the mirror that the book of James says. You look into that mirror, and the Bible will show you who you are, not who you think you are. And so the Bible gives us an accurate, true depiction and reflection of who we are. But that was a favorite, consistent phrase of his. What verse are you looking at today? And it was very, very interesting in what others were finding in God's Word. And just a beautiful man, just a beautiful person. Kindness, the gentle witness of the goodness and the mercy of the Lord. They were undeniable. He had few possessions in this life. He received a small amount of uh, money into his trust fund. But others around him that had even less than him, he shared it with them. Very, very uh, selfless in his sharing. His prayers sounded like someone who hadn't seen someone in a long time. Like when they got excited about a visit from a friend from a long, long way off. And I'm totally convinced of this, that when he prayed, his focus was so upon God that he forgot whoever was present. I remember praying with him, lead, asking him if he would lead prayer, and just the presence of the Lord, just praising God, blessing the name of God. And I believe that he was so conscious and so in the presence of his Lord that he forgot that I was even there. That's the kind of walk Abel Ochoa had. And I watched that for many, many years. And let me tell you, if there's a fake that I'm visiting, if there's a hypocrite, those other men tattle. They are very good at tattling. They'll tattle on someone, and they'll tell me. But everyone had great respect for this God chaser, this man of God, Abel Ochoa. Again, I never knew the old Abel. But he told me one day that he was a liar a thief, a bully, someone who treated women and abused them very badly, a drunk, a dopehead, and on and on he self-described the old Abel. I believed him, and a verse of Scripture comes to my mind even to this day when I think of him. I thought about it. And I continue to think of this verse of Scripture when I think about Abel Ochoa. Isaiah 61, 3. To give them beauty for ashes, the oil of gladness for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. I am absolutely convinced that sometime after 6 o'clock on the evening of February 6, 2020, that Abel Ochoa saw the face of his Lord and his Savior, Jesus Christ. As the execution began after his final statement, 23 minutes later, he was declared deceased. Abel Ochoa no longer walked by faith. 
but I'll say it this way, he walked by faith because the faith of not seeing Jesus but believing him, that's faith by faith. But seeing Jesus upon your entrance into heaven is walking by faith. I hope you're a person who wants to see the face of God. You want to see the Lord Jesus Christ. I hear people talk about dying, and they say, well, I want, I'm looking forward to seeing my mother, my brother, my grandmother, and all the different friends that they list. And I know what they mean. At least I hope I know what they mean. But it is true for a Christian that, number one, we want to see Jesus. We want to see the one who made heaven possible, who made the forgiveness of sin a reality, the one who is the mediator between God and man, the one who bridged, if you will, that deep, deep, wide abyss and made it all possible to get to God's heaven. We want to see Jesus. What an incredible day. I think about that. My mind can't grasp that. As big as I can think, I know it's bigger. I think about the beauty of our world, beauty of the mountain, the beauty of the valleys, beauty beauty of the sunset, the beauty of the of lakes and waterfalls and oceans. And the Bible says it has not entered the heart of man what God has prepared for the saints. Oh, the area of hearing. I've heard a lot of good music in my time. I've heard some really talented people sing. But I believe it's going to pale compared to what I'm going to hear in heaven is the chorus, or the choir rather, sings and praises and rejoices in the Savior, Jesus Christ. I even believe he's going to tune some of us up that don't have that talent. I don't know if the miracle is going to be in our voice or everyone else's ear. I'm joking there. But I do believe everyone who is redeemed will praise the Lord. Psalmist said, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And I absolutely believe there is that declaration of praise that will come out of every life and every set of lips. Well, I miss Ochoa a little bit, but if I could, I wouldn't call him back. I absolutely wouldn't call him back. He lived in a six by ten. We talked about that a lot. Uh, that the housing for a death row inmate is six foot by ten foot. And he said when he was uh, moved to a new cell, they moved them around by, I don't know what the rhyme or the reason of that is, but every few months uh, uh, you can expect to pack your bags and go to a new cell and have uh, uh, new neighbors. But Ochoa told me that when he was moved to a new cell, he walked every corner as far as he could get. Uh, the bed is uh, it's anchored into the concrete and it's next to the uh, uh, you know to the wall. You can't walk there, but every place that his foot would step, he would walk and prayer and prayerfully pray over that cell and say, "Now, God, this this belongs to you. I belong to you. This area belongs to you. May it be used." to praise and to worship the Lord Jesus. He told me he thanked God for his sale. He said, you know, I look at my life and the food is not good here, but I have food. He said, there are others in this world that are hungry and they don't have the consistent meal that I have. So I praise God for my meals. I was very, very grateful, not a complainer. Well, I want to introduce you to a second God chaser. He's uh, more well known among others than Abel Ochoa, and his name is Dwayne Buck, but everyone called him Brother Buck. I don't know how that came about, but whether they were believers or not, he was simply Brother Buck. He was an African American short of stature, and quite a blessing. 
And I don't know where I should begin on this, but for quite some time I kept hearing about Brother Buck. And when I would ask about him, quite often the response by others would be to give me a look of unbelief, followed by the words, You haven't met Brother Buck? Why not? And they almost made me feel, by not meeting Brother Buck, uh, what other things do you not know about? And so I was quizzed about Brother Buck, and I didn't know Brother Buck, and I was told that I ought to know Brother Buck, and we go on and on there. We did eventually meet. Some time went by, and I received a letter from Brother Buck. The first thing I noticed on that letter was the return address. Everything about the address was correct, written according to form, except for one thing. He had added within the address the words, Life Row. Where Death Row would have been placed, he put Life Row. And that simply made me a little bit more intrigued. I opened the letter. It began with various scripture that he had put on the top before he got into the letter, the body of the letter, various verses of scripture. Then he greeted me. And then he said something to the effect, I want to meet you because I'm tired of people telling me they can't believe we haven't met. So I'm asking you to make it happen. And it was followed by little smiley faces. Well, in the letter, he told me where he had grown up, quite a bit about his background, information. And then the rest of the letter, he discussed God's Word. He ended that letter as he ended all letters that I ever received from him. Blessed by the best, Brother Buck. We did get to visit. That first visit, I remember we had an allotment of time, but time just blew by. It went by way, way too quickly. We met many times after that. And I can truly say he was a bright light for Jesus Christ. When he smiled, his whole countenance beamed. I mean, there was, if you will, uh, there was a glow upon that man. And that may be hard for you to put your mind around, but it was beyond a smile. I've been around happy people who smile and who laugh and who chuckle. But there was something about the joy this man had in Christ, in his love for Christ, that just, you could almost feel it emanate off him. You could, you just got in, it's like you stepped into, into something and were charged, almost like an electrical charge. When you, you were just in within six feet of this man, you felt this is God coming off of this man. I don't know how to explain that. And I probably just, just did a terrible job of it, but I, I know what I know, and I know what I experienced, and I experienced it more than one time. His prayers, they were heavy on praise and adoration of the Lord, and they were light on petitioning. They were more about worshiping and thanking God and praising His holy name. That stood out quickly to me. He wasn't someone who was just asking God for things. He genuinely enjoyed being in the presence of his Savior. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. During one of our visits, he brought this up. He mentioned how much he enjoyed our visits. And then he said that so many men down here at the prison had not heard the gospel or in those that knew the gospel were babes in Christ and they needed to be challenged and encouraged to walk out their faith. And he told me that he'd be willing to give up our visits in order for others 
to have a visit so that I could have more time to reach others. There was something very selfless about that. It was one of the most selfless things I have ever encountered in prison. You see, a visit is gold to an inmate. It doesn't get any better than that. Their days in those in those cells are the same day every day. You could almost die of boredom in a prison because sameness begat sameness, begat sameness, and on and on. So to get a visit, that's gold. We agreed to visit, but our visits were going to be occasional. We were going to not visit as often. And then he told me that he was going to send me a list of inmates who he thought might need a visit. This list was rather large, and he gave me a little commentary about the particular inmate, some of his thoughts there. And he said, I'm praying over this list. I'm praying over these men, and I'm praying over you, and may God direct your steps. Well, the Lord blessed. He absolutely blessed. Several of these men would come to Jesus Christ as their Savior. Several of these men would walk with God. And many of those men that were on that list have since been executed. I believe they're in heaven because of the love and the prayers of Dwayne Buck. There's especially a couple of these men who became almost like my children. They've both since been executed. But Brother Buck continued to witness, teach Scripture, and challenge those who were involved in false teachings. And then he received an execution date. September the 15th, 2011, his execution was set. After that date was set, this is what he told me. If God wants me to come home, I'm coming home. But if God wants me to stay, I'll stay. God's will will be done. He did not look toward his execution in any fearful fashion whatsoever. It was a reality, and it truly was in the hands of the Lord. Well, that date came, and six o'clock came, and The uh, court, the Supreme Court, had had not given the okay. There you are, the last court. And they sign off on it either, yes, let it proceed, or will give sometimes a temporary stay. And it was well after 6 o'clock when the execution could have begun. And several hours later, they came to Brother Buck and said, your execution has been stopped. And all he said was, Mercy triumphs over judgment. That is a verse of Scripture out of the book of James. Buck's death sentence, some six years later, October the 3rd, 2017, was commuted to a life sentence. You want to guess what Brother Buck is doing right this minute? He continues to minister to those around him. He's a powerhouse a lighthouse for God, and any one he crosses paths with, he's either leading them to the Lord, he's either planting precious seed, watering seed, encouraging a brother. The ministry God has given him continues, and it continues to bless, and lives continue to change. And he continues to chase after the one who is worthy to be sought, and that is the Lord our God. Dwayne Buck is absolutely, positively, and to this day I have contact with Brother Buck, and God is using Brother Buck. God said, son, you're going to have to stick around a little bit longer, and so he's still on the planet. 
God bless you. Thank you so much for stopping by. May the Lord be your all, all the time. I pray that you're hungry and thirsty for righteousness, for the kingdom of God. I pray that you want God this moment. You are pursuing God. There is a thirst and a hunger in you that you've never had. Please don't be satisfied with all these religious fillers. It's sad to me that people come to me and they'll say, have you read this? And it's the latest Christian bestseller. Well, I realize there are very good books that are being printed today. But I also realize there's junk that is being filled or printed today. It's self-help. It's how to better yourself and how to get ahead and all that stuff. We're new creations in Christ. Read the Bible. Read the Scripture. Let God talk to you through His timeless Word. You know, the Bible is the only book that when you sit down to read it, the author is present to interpret it for you. Read the Bible. Be exposed to the Word of God. And folks... They, t they said to the Apostle Paul, was a madman. And he was okay with that because he was mad in love with Jesus. He was madly passionate about the Savior who had mercy on his soul. God bless you. I love you. And I hope you'll stop by again. And that concludes our broadcast today. Please don't forget to subscribe to the podcast through Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Plus, check us out at our Facebook page or at brevistalk.com and take a look at our blog. And remember, be kind. Always be kind.